And I do a lot of stuff for the community that I'm not getting a benefit from other than being able to share. Welcome to the LabVIEW Experiment. I am your host, Sam Taggart from SAS Workshops. In my 15 years of working with and training developers, I've had the opportunity to conduct a lot of experiments. Over here, we believe in embracing failure as the essential learning experience that it is. And what better way to learn than from other people's mistakes? In this podcast, I talk to industry experts, colleagues, and friends about their failures and how they have turned them into future successes. So it is NI Connect 2023, and I am sitting here with Quentin Aldridge. If you don't know who I'm talking about, you probably know his name is Q, because that <laughs> is what he goes by on all the forums and stuff. So why don't you start by just tell us about your nickname, because I know you got okay. an interesting story behind that. Well, it really started with my older brothers, because we're all Star Trek fans. And so, you know, next generation, there's the character called Q. And so they called me that because of the Star Trek reference. But it kind of evolved from there. My first job out of school, I worked for, you know, ATK in a mechanical test lab. And there, my job was to make, you know, maintain their test equipment. And, and so I, I basically worked to make all of the technicians' jobs easier by automating stuff and, you know, that sort of thing. So one guy started call it, calling me Q for the James Bond reference. And he'd always walk into my office and go, Q, what do you have for me today? You know, in his best Sean Connery voice. And, you know, because I made all of the gizmos that helped <laughs> them do their job. So, <laughs> and so after that, I just kind of made it my brand sort of, you know, and, and started up my own consulting, you know, Q Software Innovations, kind of playing off of that too, you know, and, and then, you know, wrote Q Controls, yeah. playing off of that too, so. <laughs> yeah, well, it works. Yeah. You've got like the Madonna name recognition thing going, it's like, <laughs> only you've got it down from like one name to like one letter. To one letter, letter yeah. Yeah, so that's like and, even more popular or something. And, and it helps out a lot too, because like all growing up, you know, with a name like Quentin Aldridge, I don't even necessarily pronounce my name yeah. right sometimes. So I got it spelled all sorts of different ways and, yeah. you know. It also fits on business cards easier and, and yeah. domains and stuff because it's nice and short. <laughs> yeah, it's harder to find domain names though. Yeah, well, I, I named my original company System Automation Solutions, which sounded great until mm -hmm. I tried to fit it on a business card and I immediately realized I made a mistake. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Quentin is very involved in the community, does all kinds of stuff. We'll touch on a lot of that. Um, <laughs> why don't we talk first about the LabVIEW Wiki, because that is the getting started point for getting started with LabVIEW. Mm -hmm. so. so a little bit of history behind it. Actually, Michael, and I'm going to pronounce his last name Abby wrong. Aviolatus, I Abby believe. Aviolatus. He'll tell me. I guess he'll tell me in the feedback if I got it wrong, but I think that's okay. how you say it. Sorry, Michael, if I got it I wrong I don't know. Again. I might have it wrong, too, but I, I'm, he, maybe I'm in the Dunning-Kruger effect, but I'm very confident that that's he, how you say it. But he forgives me, thank goodness. Yeah. But uh, he started it back a long time ago, and it's actually his server and stuff that it runs on. And it probably ran from like 2007 to like 2012 or somewhere around there. And then it kind of died. And, and about 2018, I came to the CLA summit and, you know, you might've been there at that, at that one. Probably. And we talked about how to help, you know, on, on board more people and, and stuff and, and how to, to really get people involved. And one of the things that I kind of, presented there was, well, we need to have a LabVIEW wiki, you know, and, and a lot of people liked the idea. And so I went and started a new one, you know, <laughs> just on, on, you know, the fandom site or whatever. And Michael actually came to me and goes, you know, I still have the old one. It still exists. I mean, it's not published right now or anything. You know, what about resurrecting that and you moving your content over and stuff? And so, I did that, and then I've added tons to it since, you know, and and my hope is, you know, uh, a couple of the NI folks, with one of the guys that was over the forums is like, oh, well, the NI wiki competes with the forums, and I'm like, well, no, it doesn't. It's not really for question and answer, you know, and I says, if anything, it kind of competes with the help, but really, it's supposed to be the help through all of the years. Yeah, it's got the history. Component. You know, and the history component to it. 
and a lot more how to do things, you know, mm -hmm. not just not just like what would be in a standard help file, but actually, you know, some reasons why you would use mm -hmm. some of the things. One of the things that I hope to provide on the LabVIEW Wiki is like when things get deprecated or replaced, it tells you what version of LabVIEW got replaced and with, and with what, so that if you're sitting there Googling, well, how do I do this? You know, or let's say you open old code and you see a deprecated red property node in there and you're like, well, what should I replace this with? You go Google it and it, tells you, you know, the LabVIEW wiki would tell you what to replace it with. And so it's kind of like the help file through all the years, all the history. Another thing that's really good for it too is we try to post a page for every presentation. And so like at NI Connect, we're recording all the presentations. Well, not all of them, the, mm -hmm. the track that matters. Um. <laughs> <laughs> the one that we software developers care the about. Soft, the, the ones that we software developers care about. But, you know, like GDevCon posts their videos mm -hmm. and, and stuff. And we want to have a page for every presentation for, for all those things. And, and the reason why they each have their own page is because I would really like to invite the presenters to go edit their page and add, like, their company links, mm -hmm. add any other resources they want <clears throat> to, add link, internal links to the wiki, like if they did a presentation on you know, CICD, they could link to other resources, you know, for those things. And then then just making it all easy to, to search and, yeah. and find. Has uh, that been happening? People no. Don't. So I have a question <laughs> uh, about the contribution. I, oh. I, wish, I wish it would. Unfortunately, wikis have this kind of, what do they call it, the 90%, 9%, 1%. Uh, where it's 90% consumers, 9% editors, and 1% <laughs> contributors. Yeah. I wish it would be a lot more contributors, but... Yeah, you know. I, I have to admit I'm probably in the editor phase. Yeah. I, I've edited a few things, and I've contributed maybe one or two small things, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, if if all the people did was went and, and, and updated their presentation page, that would be awesome, you know. So there's your ask. So there's, there's an ask for everybody out there, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I will. I am sure I have several on there. So mm -hmm. now I guess now that I say I'm going to do it, I guess I have to do it. Right? Somebody's <laughs> going to hold me to account. Well, I've got a lot of time before this gets published. So yeah, maybe it'll be done by the time this gets out there. <laughs> Another really cool thing on the and I need to shout out to Brian Hoover and a couple of other folks. Another thing that was brought about on the LabVIEW Wiki is a getting started page. Yeah. And and so that getting started page is really helpful as a front door. If, if you're trying to introduce someone to LabVIEW and, and the LabVIEW community and stuff, you know, give them a link to that at least. And, and if you think there's problems with it, I mean, you can always contact me and we can talk about it and stuff, but that's kind of the list that we compiled of things that we thought were good starting points. Okay, so if yeah. I have a new LabVIEW developer that I've hired and I say I don't even know anything about LabVIEW, that is the place to send them? Yeah. As opposed to like the NI getting started or whatever, which I'm sure it's probably linked. I don't know okay. <laughs> about yeah. that one, but. Okay, yeah. I mean, I mean. But it has those types of resources. Yeah. Okay. It, it will tell you where like people's videos are, you know, uh, okay. some like of the blogs. online training, where the blogs are, yeah. Some of the starting subjects like what is data flow, how to do, you know, certain basic things in LabVIEW, yeah. you know, stuff like that. So. Cool. Yeah, I don't know. I've noticed a handful of questions lately on various forums, and it's obvious to me that people are not going through that LabVIEW Core 1, Core 2 because they're asking some very basic, basic yeah. questions. And, yeah, it, it's a practice in empathy. <clears throat> yeah. I look at it, and I'm like, eh, maybe you should just go take the course. But I, I don't actually there's, say that. There's some people that on the forums where you're like, you know, I know you're just trying to get me to answer your homework question, and I'm sorry, I'm yeah. not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, so the ones that I saw recently, I think they were honestly like good faith attempts, but it was just obvious that like if they would take the very basic class, it would answer their question. But mm -hmm. I try yeah. to remember you don't know what you don't know, so yeah. you know, they're, they're was, doing their best. But I was involved just recently with a panel with Nancy and Chris Chilino and Mark. Uh, the training thing, yes, I, yeah, I heard Mark. about that. I did not actually watch it. Ridgely. Ridgely, yeah. sorry, Mark. <laughs> My mind went blank there for a minute. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that was an interesting thing too about how to get started with LabVIEW. And we all told our stories of how we got involved first with LabVIEW and, and such. So that's, you know, that's something people could go watch too to get an idea of 
Is you, it better yeah. to go with NI's training or is it better to go with somebody else's training? Yeah. And we all have very, we all, all, you know, four of us had different views on that, but they're all valid views and, you know, so. Yeah, well, that's an interesting topic because I just did a webinar on that as well. Mm -hmm. Something about like beyond NI training, like the stuff that you need to learn that they don't teach you because, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, NI training, I think has a place, mm -hmm. but it's not like the only thing you need, right? Mm -hmm. There's other stuff that, there's other way, avenues and ways to learn and things to yeah. learn too beyond that. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. I need to go watch that and see what you guys <coughs> talked about. I, I meant to, and I don't know what happened. I just <laughs> forgot. But uh, you mentioned Brian Hoover. Or yeah. Hoover. Yeah. It, it goes by Hoover on the forums. Hoover on the uh, forums I need to interview yeah. him. That would be a good interview. Yeah. He, he's quite a character and he's got lots of good things to say. And, oh, yeah. But yeah, the rusty nails though. You got to talk about that. Yeah. Wiki, right. That, that's in there. Yeah. The rusty nails post. I don't know who named it that. I think it actually cites the person that named it. Did it, it come from Hoover? I always associate Hoover I, with that, might, but I don't know. It might be Hoover's, but I think it came from someone else. But what that is in reference to is if you're playing around in the attic or, or I guess in the basement, whatever you want to say, you better be watching out for the rusty nails that are poking out. So you don't bump your head. So you don't bump your head. Well, what that was in reference to was just all of the things you can get into in LabVIEW, like there's a the lot super of super secret stuff, <coughs> super yeah. secret private stuff. There's a lot of LabVIEW hacking, and I get called a LabVIEW hacker because I like to explore the attic and the, the basement and find all of the secret stuff. And, and it's a good thing to do, actually, because <laughs> features come from that. If it wasn't for Brian Hoover and some others, Michael and probably like Jack Dunaway and those guys who were exploring the secret aspects of scripting in LabVIEW and and going through the back door to get to LabVIEW scripting, it would have never been made a public feature, you know? It would have never bought, been brought to the limelight. And so scripting, if you don't know, was actually the, the, the VI server was around since LabVIEW 5. And kind of there was some scripting aspects to it all the way to, let's see, it was... 2009, I think, is when they officially made it. 2009 is, they had a kit, they had a separate download for it. Okay. And 2010 is when it finally shipped. Mm -hmm. And so it had been around for a lot longer than that. And if, it did, if they didn't have those people like us prying in and, and finding why it's useful and telling NI, this is useful, you need to make this public, you know, then it might not have been. And... So. <laughs> so can you tell our audience what VI scripting is? Because we both know what it is, but yeah, that's they right. might not. So, so really, every aspect in LabVIEW, every component that you can put on the screen, either on the front panel or on the block diagram, have a, a reference and a class associated with it. And so it's called the VI server. Or, the, or you can talk about the class hierarchy between them. It's got some object-oriented class hierarchy under the hood that's called the VI server class hierarchy. And you can, you can read about this on the LabVIEW wiki too. And you can basically manipulate, you can write code to write code. So you can write code to manipulate your code. And, and that's kind of the stuff that allows us to do things like, well, QuickDrop, mm -hmm. you know, was programmed. QuickDrop, if you don't know, even though it's an add-on to LabVIEW IDE, it is programmed in LabVIEW. It is programmed in G-code. And so it is doing scripting under the hood to go and find stuff and put it on your block diagram. A lot of the tooling around DQMH wouldn't have been possible without scripting because it automates a bunch of tasks for you and codes stuff for you and to make things easier. And there's a lot of extra add-on tools out there that wouldn't have been possible without except being able to automate writing code so that's what vi scripting does for you yeah it's a very useful tool used mm -hmm. in all kinds of stuff vi analyzer is another one mm -hmm. so it lets you not just manipulate code but also pull pieces to, out of it yeah. and analyze it so yeah, yeah all around generally useful stuff yeah probably more on the software engineering side so if you're if yeah. you're like the casual user just plugging in a scope card <clears throat> and taking a few readings you might not run into that yeah. but you in probably use it but don't know it yeah well, really, you're using the VI server whenever you're like setting enable or disable of a control. Yeah. You know, if you want VI scripting, you can go go look at this on the LabVIEW wiki too. It'll tell you how to turn it on because it doesn't natively turn on. Yeah. You have to 
go into the tools and options and turn it on. Express VIs have to have some VI scripting under mm -hmm. the hood too, don't they? I bet they? you it does, I, yeah. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. So. Yeah, and, and there's basically, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's basically three reasons why you use VI, VI scripting, if I can remember them. It's on the, it's on the LabVIEW wiki. Oh, inspection? Yeah, it's, it's manipulation uh, and creation, yeah. right, or something like yeah, that. Basically probably. Like that. Yeah, you can see what's there. You can move it around and change it, and or you can create, create new stuff. Yeah. yeah, that sounds about right. I, I didn't I, look at the page, but that that, that sounds like that it sounds hits right. I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So you're also part of G Central and the yeah. GID Exchange. Yeah. So so that's something that was was really Christian Lino's big drive and I got on board when when he was pitching it and and became one of the you know the 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 first well I'm on the board of directors yeah. with Chris founder and, board member and founder yeah. and and stuff and and we had lots of lots of other help from lots of people and Fabiola's one and and Brian Powell uh, I think Powell's yeah. one and even There's even Jeff even Jeff Kadaski helped us when we were first coming up with our mission statement. And really what G Central's mission is, is to try to help the LabVIEW community, you know, better itself. Really, that's our vision. But we do that through basically three ways. We want to make tools easier to find, especially like open source tools. We want to, to see now my mind's going to go blank on this too, help, help people collaborate right. on tools and just help more tools get created. Yep. And and sharing code, I think, was one of the yeah. big ones, right? Yeah. And so, you know, at, at first, before before JKI tackled it, we were thinking, OK, we need to have a search tool to help search for packages. And th you know, think what, what JKI has done, because VIPM dot io has helped out a lot with that so is the the search functionality of gcentral kind of falling off the radar then as like a little bit okay. we've modified it a little bit and we'd like to to get our new website out we haven't been able to get it up and running this is um, not the original right because it was a yeah. matthias or somebody or somebody did it originally yeah. in labview and then i think derek redid it and then you yeah. guys hired somebody or something that yeah De derek is still the is one that programmed okay. derek bomberito program most of our, our new website that's still not 100% complete, which is why it's not out there yet. But what we added is, well, we do index VIPM.io. Mm -hmm. But if you click on one of those links, it takes you to VIPM.io. Yep. Yeah. You know, so it's just another avenue to search for that. But the other part that we've added is we wanted to make it so that people could publish their code in other ways besides VIPM, like if they had it on Git on one of the Git repositories, mm -hmm. you know, GitHub, GitLab, GitLab yeah. uh, Lassie, and, you know, Bitbucket. Or if they even had code published on the forums or anywhere else, they could just go put in a URL, put in a description, and that becomes a searchable thing. Okay. You but know? it's relying on people to put that. It still, re it still relies on people to put their stuff in. I, I was going to say, you could probably, it would be easy enough, I would think, to troll GitLab and GitHub and look for mm -hmm. LabVIEW code. On the forums, that would be kind of hard. I guess yeah. you control and see where people would put up VIs or VIPM packages or something, but. Because mm -hmm. there is a bunch of stuff out there that's useful that's not published in a package. Yeah. You know. Lava code repository. Yeah. Stuff there too. Yeah, stuff there too. The, the, the thing is, is in, and our first big vision was to be like, I don't know if you know, I don't know if it's called PyPy or PyPI. Yeah, Chris did say that was his inspiration. That, that was kind of the inspiration because you know, why is there such good adoption of Python? You know, well, besides it being free. The other part is just the wide, vari you know, wide variety and wi wide range of toolkits that are out there that you could just download and use. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to be able to help facilitate that kind of thing for LabVIEW. And so <clears throat> now, you know, so we're still, we're still wanting to get that website done and we're looking for help for that. And then the other aspect of it is we want to help more stuff get created, you know, and good stuff get yeah. created. And that's why we started the GID Exchange. <clears throat> and so the GID Exchange, the idea behind that was, you know, people have ideas of what they want to have created or they have something half-baked, you know, that's 80% done but not polished up. And the GID Exchange was to try to crowdfund those ideas to get finished or get made. 
Now it's been kind of slow going because it's hard to get uh, individual programmers to contribute money, you know, because we don't have like deep pockets or anything, but our goal is to get corporations to start, mm -hmm. you know, donating money towards stuff like that and try to demonstrate to them that there's a return on investment <clears throat> because these toolkits exist you know, if you donate some money, they're going to keep being maintained and they're, yeah. and they're going to still be usable for the long term. So that's, that's something we're still working on. I think the way to sell that is to find something that some corporation wants to build and if they don't have the, the in-house knowledge to do it, that mm -hmm. would be the thing. Yeah. Like, hey, we could go develop this driver for XYZ, mm -hmm. but if we, pay, if we pay G Central, then they could do it and mm -hmm. then it would be available to everybody too. Yeah. So. I don't know. There's probably some proprietary thing in there too with some companies that don't want to share. Don't want to share, yeah. And so one of the things that we're launching with that soon is we actually have an idea exchange forum that we're launching with the help of NI. And so the the you'll have still have the Lab UID exchange, but now you'll have a forum called the called the GID exchange in the forums. And the purpose for that is actually to to solve one of the things you complained about and, and brought to our attention is, is you're like, it's when we talked about it before, you're like, it's not very transparent. You know, we don't know what's going on until you finally publish a campaign saying that something's ready to get funded, you know? And so what this will be is that will be the front door for someone to submit new ideas. So they go submit the idea on the GID exchange on the forum first, and then people can debate it, they can discuss it, they can upvote it, and then once it gets enough traction, then we will try to make it a campaign for yeah. actual funding. Yeah, no, I think there's something that could be done with like social kind of things where you could mm -hmm. like give people badges and stuff, I support this idea or that yeah. idea, because I think that would give it some credit, because I think if people looked and they saw other people contributing to it, mm -hmm. I think that would, you know. you know, and that's something we're actually looking into. Yeah. Where G Central is looking into what is the cost of having Credly, which is the the same system that NI uses oh, for okay. their badging and for yeah. the, la the the Lab U Champion badges. And so we're looking into that and and seeing if that's something that we can't add. Saying, hey, if you support, if you program an open source toolkit, then yeah, and it passes our maybe we'll have some community guidelines of what counts as quality and then if you pass that then you get you know to advertise hey I, I'm a contributor to LabVIEW open source you know and yeah I think I definitely I've been trying to convince people that we should start paying for open source tools and donating to them and stuff for a while mm -hmm. and I think part of it is if people actually saw that like other people were doing it and mm -hmm. contributing to it, like, you know, if people say, hey, Sam donated X amount to this particular thing, mm -hmm. like, A, they're like, oh, that tool must be worth it, mm -hmm. right? And then they're like, oh, maybe I should start paying for some of the tools that I use. Like, you yeah. know, like I think some people, it just doesn't occur to them. It's just like, mm -hmm. oh, it's free and like, you know, <clears throat> but like free things only stick around if, as long yeah. as somebody's willing to maintain them. And, mm -hmm. you know, if there's no incentive and no money in maintaining them, at some point it's going to fall apart. So, yeah. like... And, and there's other things out there, like like Olivier approached us once about Antidoc, and he's got his own Patreon account, you know, yep. to, to ask for funds to help maintain that. And I think that's a totally valid, you know, aspect, mm -hmm. too. I wish there was a way that us as G Central and the GID Exchange could help him as well, you know, and, and make that a... Yeah, I wonder if maybe, in, I don't know if it would make sense to recreate what Patreon is doing, but maybe some sort of thing where like, mm -hmm. so they could sign up, that open source maintainer could sign up with you guys and then people could donate through you. I yeah, don't know. I don't know. Yeah, Patreon already exists and it's easy, but like Enrique also has like his buy me a cup of coffee thing on mm -hmm. the First Panther dashboard and... Yeah. Yeah. So there's other ways besides G Central to do it. And so I hope we're not reinventing the wheel, but you know, we're just trying to help better, better and more things get made. Did you know that the LabVIEW Experiment has a Patreon? All memberships include access to a private Discord server where you'll be able to chat with other fans. Benefits to membership include behind-the-scenes content and sneak peeks at new episodes, as well as opportunities to chat and even code with Sam. To learn more, check out our website, www.thelabviewexperiment.com. It's your contributions that keep our experiment going. Thanks. One of the things that's kind of cool that we're involved in too this year, I should pl 
plug this is the summer of LabVIEW. Yep. And so this is something that Derek, again, Derek Bomberito and, and Darren Natten uh, did internal to their team at NI last year. And it's basically just a series of programming competitions. And uh, <clears throat> we got involved as, as the GID Exchange Committee, part of G Central, to kind of help them do this this year and, and take it out to the whole community. And so the, the big one is the square battle. Mm -hmm. And so you can go download the toolkit now from VIPM.io for square battle and learn how to make your own square and a square basically is your own AI, not officially AI, but your own... Uh, probably implement AI. You could probably somehow, implement you something. Doing, you yeah. could implement anything you want. In fact, that's kind of the point is to stretch the boundaries. But essentially, you get a view of the game board, which is just a grid. And you, you have squares that occupy one space. And you can choose to do things like, I want to move, or I want to replicate or you can look, ar look around and see if there's an enemy and say attack the enemy, you know. <clears throat> and the whole goal is to program an algorithm that grows and takes over as much of the board as possible. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Derek's got a system that you'll be able to submit those squares soon. He's not got it up and running yet, but he will have it up and running soon. But you can already start programming it. So and, I have a question. I, I looked at this, but I didn't actually do anything. How much time is involved in putting together just like a very basic square? Can you do it like an hour or two? Or is yeah, it like, probably. Okay. Um, but you could, of course, spend it, way more time if you want to. It probably won't really be very accurate. smart and be able to do things. I think I wrote one when it originally came out because this this came out from Endigit. They were the original programmers of Square yep. Battle. That came out several years ago. That was like yeah. back when NI Week was NI Week. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I programmed one that just basically grew as a diamond. It just basically kept growing out. Yeah. And obviously that wasn't very good because once one, it, once you have a square that's kind of landlocked, you can't do anything with it, you know? Ah. So it can't move, it can't grow, it can't fight, yeah. you know? So you, it's kind of a balance between moving out and, and, and expanding. So mine didn't do very well, but I didn't program, it didn't take me that long. I think we, they introduced it during a user group and we had an hour to program ours, and then we fought them. Oh, okay. You cool. know? <laughs> okay, so like in a very short amount of time, you can have something up and running. You can have something up and running. And Derek's made it really even even more simple of what you need to... to he's got like project templates and stuff that already gets you started. Okay, so. cool. Yeah, I'll have to check that out more. Yeah. yeah, I was just trying to debate, like, do I want to put the time and effort into it or not? But so it could be fun. so that's, that's the big one. And, and you know that we're going to be hopefully broadcasting or doing some kind of presentation at yep. GDevCon NA to do the final battle of that. But that's not the only competition that's happening. Derek's got like a, a maze solver. I think there's like a boggle game or something like that. Yeah. I can't, I can't remember all of them. I think he's got three or four that are not. <clears throat> so, so that the square battle is kind of a head to head where two people program an AI and they fight against each other. Well, the other ones are basically just a score. You just, you get, it's, it's kind of more like the advent of code where okay. you get a input and you submit the output and you get a score based on that, you know, ah. so. Is it measuring like performance or is it like you either get the right answer or you don't or how do those? I think on some of those. Or like I, style I'm or. I'm not entirely sure how like the maze is scored, it might be uh, like a timing thing or something ah. like that. There How should also be like a judge's score for like most creative or something. Mm -hmm. That would be kind of cool. And so along with the, the whole badging the idea, we're hoping to be able to give badges for people that participate in that, but we're still exploring that avenue. And even, even Nancy said that maybe NI would sponsor the badges for that this year. And so they would host them on their system. Ah, very but cool. Yeah, because they have not a badging sure. yeah. system somehow, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure how that's, if that's going to come about. I hope it does, but, <laughs> yeah, I, you know. <clears throat> but it would be cool to be able to give everyone a badge that participates saying, hey, I participated in Summer of LabVIEW 2023, yeah. and 
be able to advertise yeah. that. So for the square battle thing, you get 10 points or certification points. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. You can actually get recertification points for some of this, too. Yeah. By the time this gets published, they'll be after the fact. But yeah. yeah. But if we do it again next year, it'll probably be the same deal. So There's there's plans to do it. Keep keep it going every year. So. Yeah. yeah, I like the idea of doing some kind of coding challenge, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. What was I going to say? And, it, and oh. it's meant to be, you know, as low a bar... Yeah. to get into as possible to try to get people yeah. especially people that haven't done LabVIEW before to just give it a try and see yeah yeah there were some you coding know. challenges going around reddit for a while mm -hmm. and they part of the problem with that was they were like they put it did a new one every month and it was just like I didn't feel like I had time to go yeah. stop and look at it yeah I hosted one that was let's see which one did I do oh I did I, I won the I won the music visualizer one yeah. on Reddit, and then I hosted one for encoding data in a picture. Yep. But and then and then after that, someone did another one, and then after that, it just kind of fizzled. I but, do think we should do more coding for practice, because yeah. I feel like when you're doing it coding for a project, there's this mm -hmm. pressure to just churn things out. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, yeah, that that's useful, but like really to explore and try new things, mm -hmm. you need to have that freedom that freedom to fail. Mm -hmm. And when you're working on a work project, like, you know, yeah, y it's a lot harder to justify going off on tangents and trying things just to see if they work and, and mm -hmm. those type of things. So you yeah. need that the advent like, of type been environment fun for that. Yeah. Advent of code is really fun for that. It's really good for learning new languages. I've been learning Python and I've been uh -huh. doing that, yeah, but you also did it in Python last year. I yeah. remember. But even in, doing it in LabVIEW, though, I, the one year I did it in LabVIEW, I learned a lot of new things. A lot about sets and maps and some of the uh, computer yeah. science stuff that I never actually learned because I never yeah. took any computer and, science And classes. different computer science algorithms because I wasn't a computer scientist yeah. either. Jikstras so. or Jikstras or whatever it's called. Yeah. Which is actually quite useful once you figure it out, but it takes uh -huh. a little bit to figure it out. And like, uh -huh. Yeah, and some of like the traveling salesman problems and like doing uh -huh. grids. And the one yeah. I found interesting is doing the infinite grid because I'm, I'm reading this book right now that uh, does Conway's Game of Life. Like it talks mm -hmm. about all these different katas that you can do. One of them is Conway's Game of Life, but it's an infinite, it grows infinitely. And mm -hmm. so how the heck do you represent that? Yeah. And that's a very interesting. Yeah, I noticed on the advent of code ones this, this last year yeah. that, okay, well, I've, been, I, I've done it for two years now. So the first year when it was trying to do an infinite grid, yeah. I would keep trying to grow my arrays. Yeah, there's like the brute force method, which works for the smaller problem. Then they give you a big one. And, and then, apart. yeah, then it would crash usually or it would or it would take too long. I've been thinking the and better then, way is to And then I did, one for, I did one through a map this year. Yeah, yeah, you just keep a, a map better. and you keep track of the points that you care about. Yep. Yeah, you set the default as one state, and then you keep all the ones that are in a different state. And then yeah. it, it kind of works. And that and worked it's much, a lot better. Much more scalable. Yeah, because yeah, I was thinking about that for this Game of Life one. I haven't actually tried it yet, but that was in my head. It was like, you know, if I do an array, then I'm constantly moving and shifting it because mm -hmm. the zero, zero point, right, is in the center. So, yeah. so you can't start at one end and grow in two dimensions. You got to grow. Grow yeah. in all, all, yeah, yeah. all four directions. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Those are interesting challenges. I'm not yeah. sure how much that applies to day-to-day -day lab work necessarily. I'm sure there are some cases where it applies. Mm -hmm. Like some of the stuff like using sets and doing set intersections and stuff, I think is can be useful in certain parts. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just kind of depends. Mm -hmm. But I think that's part of the reason why, like in lab you we're not computer scientists or computer engineers. And I think some of those computer science, and computer engineer things don't necessarily apply to what we do. Like, you know, Sometimes, they're, they're solving yeah. different types of problems than, than the ones that we solve for the most part. But yeah, yeah, I agree. When, even though advent of code is fun, it's definitely computer science exercise yeah. more than an engineering exercise. Yeah. Do you ever do uh, Project Euler? I've done some. Yeah, 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 yeah. those are cool too. Those I, are I, good practice. I too. did that when I was learning LabVIEW. I just I, I was in a lab and I had a lot of downtime and I would just sit there and do uh, Project Euler stuff. Uh -huh. And those are also they're they're good. They teach you about programming, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's very heavily math based. And so if you know the math properties, then it's a lot easier. And mm -hmm. so it's almost as much a test of math as it is a test of programming. Yeah. Yep. That's true. Yeah. Cool. But by that, yeah, Project Euler was something that I pointed some of my new programmers to, to just, if you don't know what to program, here, go try these. Another thing that I always give them is, is go program a game. I don't care what game, just go program a game, you know, and I got all, I got all sorts of stuff. Someone programming mine, Minesweeper, Solitaire. Snake, Tic-Tac-Toe. Like Tic-Tac-Toe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
someone programmed Tetris and he made it expandable so that you could play 18 on 18, you know, 18 players. Oh, wow. It was crazy. But yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. Cool. And that, that, I guess that's one thing that I emphasized in that LinkedIn panel too, was if you want to learn LabVIEW, it's good to find something as, I mean, you don't know what to program until you have a goal of something to program, you know? Yeah, and you need to learn a language by practicing it. So, so you need to come up with something to program to be your starting point. You like know? a Harry Potter clock? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you should tell that story. <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm, I'm a big Harry Potter fan, and so I had this grandfather clock that didn't work anymore. And, and so I had this idea of programming the Weasley's clock and making it real life. Now, if you don't know the Weasley's, they're a family of wizards in Harry Potter, and each one of them have a hand on the clock, and the hand would move depending on where that family member was at, you know, home, school, you know. They even had Lost and Mortal Peril on it. <laughs> and, and so I created my own, and it's all programmed. It's a, a Raspberry Pi. And it's all programmed in LabVIEW. Well, the, the, the Raspberry Pi stuff is kind of a mix of LabVIEW and Python. Mm -hmm. And then to control all of the servos, it's Arduinos. And so, you know, Arduino C code or whatever on those. Didn't and, you also 3D print some gears or something? Yeah, okay. and so I had, to, I had to do all the mechanical design too as far, and the electrical. So I 3D printed all of the gears. And so my clock has seven hands on it. Because I don't, I won't, first I wanted to make it look like it was crazy because it had too many hands on it. And I have four members in my family, and then I wanted three hands to actually still tell the time. And wow. so, <clears throat> so it has an hour, minute, second, and then a hand for each member of the family. And what it does is it actually uses MQTT um, and has a server running in the background to essentially get information back from our phones. Mm -hmm and sets our location based on geofencing and stuff <laughs> from our phones. And so, yeah, we actually have the hands move around and, and say where we're at and yeah. Yeah, they're <laughs> already it, tracking you, might as well do something fun with it, right? Yeah, and, and it does other funny things too, like on the hour it lights up with the Hogwarts colors and, and plays the, the theme song from Harry Potter and, and so, yeah. Did a pr the the first GLA summit? I did a presentation on that and showed everybody. So <laughs> yeah, you were also going to do something with wands too. Did you ever get around to that, or is that still that's still in the works? So I have all the parts to it. I just haven't had the time. But yeah, the, the wands from the theme parks basically just have a little IR reflector in the tip, and that's oh. really all it is. And then they have IR lights and a camera inside behind where you can't really see it that you do the spell and then it does whatever. When you point you know. at it, it, it makes contact and kind of yeah. like the TV and then, and and then it has some optical character button. recognition so that you have to do the spell shape. Uh, okay. You know, do your wand the shape of the spell in order for it to work. Well, I want to do that same thing. I want to put a camera on my clock and some lights and then have you do the spell and then have it do stuff like, uh -huh. you know, one of the spells is like the, the freezing spell, Petrificus Totalis, you know. And so that that... I, I want it to like, I mean, I even have it figured out where I'm going to put in a servo to pinch the pendulum oh. so that the pendulum just freezes oh, and yeah. the clock will just freeze, you know, and then the lights will all turn blue and stuff and, you know, or, or you know, there's, there's another spell called stupefy, which is supposed to like stun your opponent, you know, so I want to do that and then have all the hands just kind of... Shoot, shoot out in different directions or, you know, <laughs> yeah, you can do, do, and there's one for like making something float when Guardium Leviosa, you know, that's a big one in the movies because they emphasize how to pronounce it, you know, and so if you did that, then like the weights of the clock would move up and all the hands would move up, you know, or something like that. Just have it do lots of funny things. Still in the works. I still want to do it, but <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, uh, that was a fun project. <laughs> Quentin is quite the uh, Harry Potter fan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So you mentioned you did this for the GLA Summit. You're also on the board of that. You want to talk a little bit about that briefly? I can. I just got kind of volunteered for that, but <laughs> and I try to help out where I can on that. That's kind of a neat conference. I mean, 
there's definitely a place and, and we want to keep the in-person conferences because that's where you do a lot of networking and stuff. But there's definitely a place for, for an online conference still, even after COVID. And that's kind of what GTABCon was, or not GTAB, uh, GLA Summit was born from, was from the COVID era. We needed to, we wanted a replacement for NI Week. They weren't going to have it, you know. And so they came up with this online conference. And it's a 24-hour conference, but it's, it's all over the world all, all at once. And they have presenters from all over the world. And I think that is great for a couple of reasons. One, it gives some people that wouldn't have had an opportunity to present because they just can't afford to travel, mm -hmm. you know, to these other events. It gives them an opportunity to present. It gives us an opportunity to hear other points of view from other people that we wouldn't have got to hear from, you mm -hmm. know, just all of this stuff. So, yeah, it's yeah. really cool. Yeah, and you can hear people from the other side of the world if you're willing to stay up in the middle of the night yeah. or something like that. I mean, the time zone thing is is kind of hard. It's again, it's 24 hours. It's kind of hard to stay up. But if there's something interesting, then it's cool. And, and they usually try to record them all, too. So Yeah, they're recorded, and they should be. I want to say we got them all up. I don't know if they're all up or I not. I know we missed a few year. of them because I, I definitely, there were a few that were missed and that I went and did mm -hmm. because somebody asked me. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if you're a presenter and it's still not up a year and several months later, ping me and I will be glad we'll, to go. We'll try to figure it, it out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, and, we definitely tried. And but. I'm a little behind on getting the pages up for those on the wiki, but... Eventually, I'd like to get the pages up for those, too. Yeah. Well, I thought that was cool because I'm also on the board, and I managed to get Andrea to come and do her presentation, which I thought was good. Because I mm -hmm. would like to see us as a LabVIEW community get... So, like, NI Week, right? Mm -hmm. When NI put it on, they, they would sometimes get outside speakers to come in. They got the astronaut guy, Scott yeah. Kelly. That was yeah. really cool. That was cool. But I would like to see us at our own conferences bring in outside speakers from, like, different parts of the software world and other places. So mm -hmm. uh, that was a good first step for that. Cool. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you're really well known for is Q controls. Oh, yeah. Do you want to talk very briefly about that? <clears throat> sure. So Q controls started because on my project at work at the time, we were starting to get to the point where our application was too large. And... And I think, I, I think people run into this a lot. So we started splitting it up into PPLs. Well, the problem was that uh, we were designing for a touchscreen. Mm -hmm. And so we had some X controls in there to help with, you know, like larger scroll bars yep. and other things that was supposed to help uh, with the touchscreen. And <clears throat> when we switched to PPLs, all of those X controls died. Because you couldn't put them in the PPL. Because we couldn't put them in the PPL. They would crash. They would, you know, keep the PPL from building, all sorts of bad stuff. And, and to be honest, X controls are kind of crashy anyway. You yeah, know? <laughs> they, they were always a lot of work. So, so for those who don't know, basically an X control is trying to move some of the UI-specific logic that's just doing UI stuff into its own separate kind of container. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, and, and, and Q controls does something and it's, similar. And it's supposed to like separate the logic that takes care of that UI stuff and separate it from like your business logic to do all the data analysis or whatever. Yep. And so I ended up inventing Q controls to do that, and and it's basically uh, an object oriented alternative to X controls. One it, of the benefits yeah. you get though is because of VI scripting, I was able to script the, the creation of all of these yeah. classes. And you basically say, let's say you want something simple like a form field that checks the data of the form, you know. And so you basically you create a queue control. The queue control has its own event handler to separate that logic to handle that. Yep. So then the user starts, you program it so the user starts typing something in and it checks it and then it can format and change color or whatever mm -hmm. you want it to do based on what they enter. If you want to inherit from the string control now, though, something that you don't get from X controls is you get all of the properties and methods yep. that a string control would normally have. X control, you had to recreate all those. X control, yep. you had to recreate them. I've, re I've gone and done the work to recreate yep. them all for you already. And so if you say, okay, I'm going to inherit from string control, I'm going to do that, then you're going to have all of the properties and methods of that. Yeah, you can set the font and all the other stuff that you could do All the stuff anyways. that you could have done anyways yeah. with the string control, you can now do still with, do with the, the queue control. control. The only difference is instead of manipulating it through the reference wire, you manipulate, the you manipulate it through the class wire. Yep. 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 And then you can add 
then extend it and add all of your own functionality. Yeah, I was going to say Q controls are all the benefits of X controls without the disadvantages, but mm -hmm. you just mentioned what an advantage that has an addition, which I had forgotten about. So yeah. that, that is quite nice. Yeah. Yeah, they are definitely, if you're doing complicated UI stuff, mm -hmm. Q controls are definitely worth looking at. Mm -hmm. Between Q controls and sub panels and breaking things up a little yeah. bit, it's definitely, it could help. And that and avoid encapsulate that stuff the better, VI yeah. syndrome where you just have this giant VI with all this stuff to this GUI <laughs> logic. Yeah, the monolithic, you know, monolithic VI or the monolithic program, you know. It's yeah, as fabulous. To up. Yeah, as fabulous says, the VI is the problem. Uh -huh. I always thought that was a funny phrase. <laughs> cool. So one of the questions I like to ask people is, tell me about an experiment that you tried that didn't turn out the way you thought it would, and what'd you learn? Okay. Let me think. Well, um, there was toolkits that I tried to publish before Q controls. One of them was an editor. It was an add-on to help you edit your documentation of your VIs. And basically, I had this idea that if you could have like the Project Explorer on one side of your window, and then have just a text editor, and then you could click through really easy through your VIs mm -hmm. and edit the text. And, and it would also have the ability to add common text that you like a copyright notice yep. or something or license notice that would get mm -hmm. copied to everything. <clears throat> and I did make one, you know, I made, made the whole thing. I, I went through the process of getting it published on the NI Tools Network. I think it still exists on there, on the NI Tools yep. Network. You can still download it from there if you want. But, and I think it's still for sale on there. And that wow. was the problem. That's the experiment was I, I tried to sell it. Wow. And <laughs> I sold five copies wow. of it in the almost 10 years it's been up now. And so what I, what I realized is when you're programming add-ons to LabVIEW, it is so, and, and you can see that by the success of Q controls, that it is better to just share it, you know? share it, give it out, let people use it for free because, you know, I just don't think there's money to be made in, in trying to sell add-ons. And so to be honest with you, if, if you want that documentation editor, it still exists. You can still use it in newer versions of LabVIEW, but get it from GitHub where I have it published for free. <laughs> I, I was going to say, that, that's one of those tools that I think everybody, I've seen a lot of people invent that tool. Yeah. So I think that, that's part of the problem with selling add-ons, right? Like, yeah. to charge enough to actually make it worthwhile, you have to charge a lot. Mm -hmm. And people are like, they're developers. So mm -hmm. they're like, oh, I can do it myself. And if your thing doesn't do exactly what they want, the way they want, they're going to want to customize it. And then they're just going to build their own, yep. I think is part of the problem. Yeah. But uh, JKI is one of the companies that always... <clears throat> amazed me like they put out like the state machine and all these state machine objects and all this stuff and like i looked at that and i was like yeah they're giving it away for free but the marketing value of that like everybody knows who they are mm -hmm. everybody knows q controls mm -hmm. or hopefully they do now after listening to this podcast so. <laughs> well, there's there's a lot of people out there that use q controls and stuff and and i think that's where i got my name out you know yeah that, that's definitely one of the ways so mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I give away stuff for free all the time because, like, you know. And hopefully, you know, mm -hmm. if you're a consultant or whatever, you give it away, they look at it, and they see, oh, he does good work, and you know, mm -hmm. then they hire you. Or the other thing yeah. is, too, like, I'm trying to put together some, like, uh, tools for continuous integration and stuff. And, like, yeah, the tools are easy. I'll give those away because the whole process of setting it up is a pain in the ass. And so I guess I'm allowed to swear on here. It's my podcast. Uh, <laughs> sorry if that offends you, Quentin. But, yeah, it's a pain. And uh -huh. so, you know. Hopefully, people will look at that and they'll be like, oh, yeah, that's great that Sam tells us how to do that, but I, that's still too complicated. I'll just pay him. Mm -hmm. So that's the goal. I'll yeah. let you know how it works in a and, few months. And, and if people want me to make them Q controls, they can pay me to make Q controls. Yeah, yeah, them. even with the Q you controls, know? right? There, there's still some customization, right? Yeah. And so somebody could look at that and say, yeah, I, I could do this myself, but mm -hmm. Quentin knows how it works and it'll be much quicker and easier to just pay him. And mm -hmm. so. I, I'm I'd sure totally if you uh, went and talked to him, yeah, he'd be happy to do that. <laughs> so, very cool. It's been great talking to you, Quinn. Yeah. I really enjoy it. Thank you for everything you do for the community. Thank you're you. like, you're probably the <laughs> most active person in the community. So, <laughs> yeah, like you tell me, I can't say no. That's really what it is. Yeah. My my coworkers when I first got made a LabVIEW champion would tease me. It says you know what that means, really, don't you? And I'm like, what? 
says it means you're willing to work for free. <laughs> yeah, it is funny. And you I know? do a lot of stuff for the community that I'm not getting a ben- benefit from other than being able to share. So <laughs> yeah, well, it is funny because a lot of people do do a, do a handful of things and they get well known and then they become a champion and it's almost like they like feel the need to up their game and start doing yeah. even more. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. That's it for today's episode of the LabVIEW Experiment. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments or questions, head over to thelabviewexperiment.com and drop me a note. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the LV Experiment.